All right. Good morning, everybody. It is Joe Ryan sitting in with Man Coverage, the boys from Man Coverage, James Bonneville, uh, Knoxville, Nate, and we got Steve Bellisier here to talk deep into the NFL draft, what's been going on the last three days, the opinions on it, what we feel, uh, the, the successes, the losses, and what, what we're going to when we're going to be talking about in a couple of years about this draft. Steve, I want to start out this morning. You know, you've been through this process for the players that are involved. How nerve wracking is it? What's it like for a player when he's waiting around to hear his name called? Yeah, I don't know if it's nerve wracking. It's more of a, I guess, annoying might be the right word, right? You've done all this work, you've done all these things, and now it's like, hurry up and wait, right? Yeah. Um, and then you see, a, you know, you saw it with CJ Stroud, right? All these teams and people are positioning to try to devalue whatever they can just to make sure they maximize, you know, this this pick and what they're going to do. So it's a weird process, right? You do all this work and then you got to hurry up and wait. And then you, know, you saw what happened with Will Levis, which I thought was, you know, unfortunate, right? You sit there all day, but it's a, it's a weird process to, to say the least. Yeah. How about, and, all, how about all the bells and whistles now that they got there? They're just trying to keep people interested, right? I mean, yeah. the NFL, I give them credit from a business standpoint. They're trying to dominate psyche year round like you used to get a break from the nfl now none of that right so it's just it's really interesting all the stuff they've added i mean but there's a hundred thousand people there live that's yeah. outstanding right yeah I mean, good for them it's crazy uh they you know taking this show on the road was definitely uh a smart move by the mm -hmm. nfl i mean i i love the draft more than anybody i sit there and watch it uh we had the youtube coverage where we had four screens kind of like we're looking at right now uh, all four channels that were covering it, we got to watch it all at once. It was uh, maximum overload, and I absolutely loved it. I don't know if I'd want to go there and stand there for three days <laughs> and stare at the uh, stage with the uh, cover band playing in between picks. Uh, I don't know if that would be fun for me, but they've definitely maximized it. Uh, but I, I do want to hit on that a little bit harder. You know, right before the draft, there was, you know, a couple of years ago, it was Justin Fields. Maybe it's just Buckeye quarterbacks. I don't know. Uh, but they, they ripped him to shreds and then they ripped uh, CJ Stroud to, to shreds. And, you know, I never, uh, I, I followed the Buckeyes. I'm a Buckeye homer. Everyone knows it. I've never thought once that he was dumb. Uh, so I just didn't understand that. And, and Steve, give us, I mean, I know that there's smoke screens. People want stuff to come out because maybe they want to draft him, but just uh, what do you think about, uh, him going through that and uh, what, why, why, why does that happen? You know, every year it seems like to somebody that calls him to fall a little bit. Yeah, I, I think part of it is we have too much time on our hands, right? I mean, after a while, what else good can you say about CJ Stroud, right? You run out of things to say, so you start pulling at straws. Um, half the stuff that I think gets reported the two to three days before the draft is kind of all BS, right? Like it's all just stuff that. People are bored and they don't have anything else to talk about, so they're going to try to dig and find, you know, the worst thing possible. That was one thing I noticed on this year's draft more than anything. You, you know, all these guys get picked, you know, the first two rounds, and they're all unbelievable football players. But yet, every commentator is like, "Well, they're going to have to work on this. They're going to have to work on that." And you get to a point where it's like, "Come on, guys, let's talk about the good things." Like it was a pretty negative slant all in, yeah. the, in my opinion on the draft, right? They just, oh, this guy's a great pick, but you could have got more value. It's like, come on, guys. I mean, I think we just have over analysis more than anything else. Um, why does it happen? Good question. I, like I said, I think it's uh, just a lot of people with too much time on their hands more than anything else. From a draftee perspective, I mean, do, do you, how much do you take that stuff to heart that you hear like especially the closer you get to draft as you know some teams are doing it on purpose to create a rumor mill to drive people down so they can get them at their position but i'm like does i mean do people do players like don't think about that once they get drafted or is it kind of something they use to go into camp of saying okay you know even they're the 10th pick all right this is what they think of me let's go get them you know to try to prove them wrong yeah i mean i think you can definitely use that i i think it's more what environment did you grow up in in college, right? You guys look at the guys that go to Ohio State, Alabama, Tennessee. Um, they are on a, they're under a microscope from day one, right? This has been happening since they were recruited out of high school. So I think for the majority of these guys, if they're listening to that stuff now, like that's a that's a problem. They shouldn't be, right? I guarantee CJ Stroud could have cared less about what people were saying two days before the draft because you know what? He's going to be a top five pick regardless. Yeah, He's make a ton of money. 
and live out his dream, right? So where are you going to focus? Where are you going to spend your time? These elite athletes shouldn't be worried about the comments. I mean, I'm sure they all have Twitter and different things. And you go look at the comments, it's, it's laughable, right? Um, so they shouldn't care and, and it shouldn't be an issue. Um, for the ones that it does become a problem, you'll see them not translate and do well into the NFL, right? You're under a microscope all the time. Now you're getting paid for it, which you're starting to see in college because of NIL. That's already kind of shifted already, that that different pressure. But if they can't handle that now, they don't belong to be a you know top round draft pick. All right. Let's let's take a look at the at the quarterbacks that were picked. I mean, number one, it was Bryce Young going down and going down to Carolina. Uh, what are you guys overall feeling about there? I mean, no, it's never perfect. It's never a perfect situation. You know, you're going to a bad team or a team that needs to be on the rise, and you're going to be the man everybody's looking to do to lead him to the promised land. What do you think of Bryce Young, who's come from only success in college, going and starting his pro career in Carolina? Give me your guys' thoughts on it. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll jump in. I think it's a great pick. Um, yeah, it's never a perfect fit, right? You're going to a team that needs help. Um, and a lot of times over the last few years, we've not seen a lot of those guys go early and really make a big impact outside of Trevor Lawrence. Right. I mean, right. think of some of the other ones. All these teams have drafted these quarterbacks high and it really hasn't worked. Trevor Lawrence has really translated. I see a lot of the growing up and never losing. Right. That's that's what he's done at Alabama in high school. And I think he'll continue to do the same. You want a guy at quarterback that's going in the NFL that's actually dealt and handled some big stays and has always been the guy. Right. He's always been the guy. And the one thing that I find most impressive with him is his ability to, you know, get to his second and third level reads. That's a key in the NFL, right? So if you look at the guys that were drafted early, I will tell you right now, the first two picked, not a problem. Yeah. I'm worried about the guy going to Indianapolis. Um, uh -huh. I've never seen him do that in college, right? You go watch his film. It's either big play downfield, single read, or he tucks it and run. Um, but I think, you know, the first pick overall, he's going to do well. Well, I, I, I look at him as being such a, I mean, leadership guy. I mean, you mm -hmm. look at a lot of cases where if, you know, you know, wins without replacement, the build baseball statistic, if you take young off the field at Alabama, what's their record really? I mean, not I, I, it's not the same. I mean, I, Nate and I were talking about that earlier. I'm like, would they be eight and four? Would they be seven and five? But they'd be a lot different because you look at their receiving core. It was not nearly as it was as good as it was prior to when Tua was there or when Mac uh, Mac Jones was there. Offensive line, I mean, it's solid, but it's not like it once was. And the defense didn't play to that high standard they once did. I mean, the the one intangible you look at Bryce Young is the guy's just a gamer. He just knows how to win. He, I mean, he, there's so many times where it looks like the, his back's against the wall and he finds the rabbit in the hat every single time. And you just, you just can't quantify that on a stat sheet. So. No, I, I like Bryce Young. I think uh, he'll be, he'll go in and start day one and uh, you know, how, how good his first season will be. That'll be uh, based on how good the Panthers uh, can protect him and uh, you know, what their skill guys look like. Um, but you know, after that, CJ Stroud, I think it will struggle a little bit in Houston cause they suck. Uh, but you know, Richardson is the one for me. I think he actually has some potential. Uh, there, there could be a high ceiling with him, but he could also be, you know, the biggest bust in this draft. So I think taking him at four where they took him, uh, is scary. You, you're, you're not going to just not play him. Okay. The first year they, I know they're saying that and they're talking, oh, we're going to play Minshew and. And uh, he's going to sit and learn. Yeah, right. Uh, wait till they're one in three or one in yeah. four and everyone's calling for him. They're going to have to put him out there uh, because of how early they took him. And, and that may not look good. I, I living down here in the southeast. I saw him play a lot. Uh, there were flashes. But overall, the, uh, you know, the consistency was was dangerously scary, in well, my opinion. Don't you all think that, I mean, everybody is going to stack the box against them? going into it because obviously they're going to be moving towards that Philadelphia offense, which was very RPO based and Jonathan Taylor. It's like not a secret. He's a pretty freaking good running back, but you look at it from a receiving standpoint. I mean, Mike Pittman Jr. is in the second year. Isaiah McKenzie's got upside, but you don't really have much at the receiver position. 
and I mean, it, 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 it's there's nobody out there that scares the crap out of you. I could see a lot of eight in the box, and hey, let's see what Richardson can do. As you were talking about James, and I'm sorry, Sergio, yeah, another thing I see as a problem here, you have a quarterback who's a project with a first-year, first-time coach, and that doesn't spell for a lot of success. We'll start with Steve. What do you think about that aspect of it? Yeah, I mean, here's the reality. Um, think about some of the most effective you know, running style quarterbacks in the NFL. Who have they been? Lamar. Michael Vick, right? Um, you know, you have guys with elite level speed that can do things differently. I, I don't see Richardson being that guy. What he yeah. did on paper, unreal, right? And just from a stats and vertical jump, you name it, it's all there. But then when you go watch the film, how does it translate into game speed? And I don't see the same same production that, you know, I, I don't see him throwing the ball that well um, and take, you know, you can say what you want, but they did nothing at Florida to help that. You look at Jalen Hurts and what he learned at Alabama, then going to Oklahoma from a passing level and scheme with a guy that can run. And they're both athletic, but it just, I don't see his game and what he's learned translating to the NFL very quickly. And that's going to be the biggest gap for me is can they take, you know, first year quarterback, first year coach, implement an offense that's going to maximize his strengths where everyone in the country, or, you know, the NFL knows they're going to do it too. It's going to be a tough road to help. It's going to be hard to see. What about you, Nate? What do you think about that guy? Yeah, you know, I, I mean, that's I, I, that's the thing with him. I mean, he, he, he could be good, but I just don't like uh, where he was taken. I mean, that's, that's the biggest thing. Taking him that high, you're going to have to start him first year, and he's nowhere near ready. I mean – uh, I do. I do like the upside with him more than than Will Levis. I I've never seen, you know. I mean, I know junior year was a little better film uh, than senior year, but senior year was so bad uh, that it really really scared me off. I, I would just be sitting there thinking this guy couldn't beat out Sean Clifford. Uh, then he transfers to Kentucky where they don't have anybody uh, that can throw it more than twenty yards. So yeah, he wins that job. But uh, there were just, I mean, point to me the game where you were like. This is this is what we need uh, to lead our NFL franchise. I just I didn't see that game anywhere with this kid, and that's why he slid. And I, I guess you know he he went early in the second round because there's such a premium on quarterbacks, and there's a lot of teams that need them. So I think that's why he was taken. But I do not, uh, as we were just talking about before the air, I don't see him uh, fixing the problem there. In fact, I I equate his game a lot uh, to Ryan Tannehill, except not as good. I, I agree with you 100%. I mean, you look at Will Levis, his good year at Kentucky. You know, what's the one factor he had there? It was Wandale Robinson, who, let's be honest, is a special talent and is showing that in the NFL. I think he's going to see another jump this year. Uh, but they had nothing at receiver, and he couldn't – I mean, you look at the difference between him and a Bryce Young. Bryce Young can make things happen. Will Levis – couldn't make anything happen. He's got a really big arm. I could tell you a ton of guys who have come through the draft who's have real big arms, like Dan McGuire, Mark McGuire's kid brother. <laughs> God, I mean Jeff George, Jeff uh, George. I mean George was more in his headspace. Billy Joe Tolliver. I mean you can go down the list. There's like a ton of guys who were freaking tree trunks who had cannons for an arm, but if you can't hit the broadside of a barn, who cares? I mean, it's like the it, it, it's like uh, Troy Williamson way back in the draft. Wow, he did really good at the combine. That means he did really wood, good in the presidential physical fitness test. But you know <laughs> something? You got to catch a ball too, as well. Otherwise, Carl mm -hmm. Lewis, uh, Carl Lewis, and Ben Johnson would have been playing in the NFL. You know, oh, that was like the 49ers trying to win with Ronaldo and Nehemiah. Nehemiah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, there's always somebody that wins the combine, right? There's always somebody that's like blows it away. Uh, Anthony Richardson, he, he kills I mean, it. And Anthony Richardson was that guy this year, and mm -hmm. he got so much coverage, uh, from that, from that combine performance. I mean, sh thank God, whoever it was told him to work out. Uh, he listened to him because hell, he got uh, picked in the you know, number four. Uh, because yeah. of that performance, he, he had a forty-inch vertical jump. He had a ridiculous freaking, uh, um, he had a ridiculous uh, forty-yard time, and his shuttles were incredible. But once you got the ball in his hand, and they were actually doing throwing drills, I mean, that's where everybody talked about C.J. Stroud. I mean, 
unless you were Helen Keller and living under a rock, you would really, I mean, Stroud killed it in Anthony Richardson. I mean, it was, it was like, you know, freaking, it was hilarious. He was not even 10 yards in some cases on just with no coverage on these guys. I mean, it was ridiculous. And how about Hendon Hooker? I mean, I think it's a good place for him to be where it would go to going to the Lions. I mean, you can lean, he can learn behind golf for a couple of years. Uh, wait to hopefully his knee gets totally re- rebuilt and everything. And what did you guys think about that pick, Steve? I, I loved it, actually. I think if you look at a couple of the, you know, it's interesting. I'll, I'll make a, a broad stick comment of this draft more than anything. There's two things teams need to win a championship, right? It's a good quarterback and a good defense. Right? That is, that's been true forever. And you look at what some of these teams have drafted. And then historically, who've been the best quarterbacks? Guys that get drafted in the second, third, fourth round because they go into a situation where they can actually learn, learn the speed of the game, learn from a, you know, a veteran, hopefully, that's doing well. And then once their time comes along, they do extremely well in that. And I, I look at Hooker's position, and I think that's going to happen in Detroit. I really do. Hopefully he gets healthy and everything goes well, but they're putting him in an offense that will match what he's trying to do. they got some good weapons that are young that need to develop and learn from a veteran quarterback. So I, I don't think you could get a better situation, right? Um, I think the same with the <laughs> it's funny Green Bay, right, and then picking up another quarterback. Another interesting pick because – they just put a lot of money into a future guy and they hope it works out, right? But these middle round quarterbacks, if you look throughout history, have become really important. Um, so it, it'll be interesting to see how this all plays out with some of these other picks. But the hooker one I thought was great for him and great for the Yeah, I like I liked it too. Uh he he doesn't have to go right on the field, which is nope. good because A, he's hurt, and B, uh there's gonna be a transition from going uh from Josh Heupel's offense. Uh, to the NFL. I mean, do I think it's as drastic as everyone's making it out to be? No, uh, but I do think they'll, it might take him some time uh, to get up, you know, get up where he needs to be. And he's not going to be forced on the field. I mean, he may get out there if he if he starts to heal up, he feels good, and um, you know, golf goes down. But golf played well last year. I mean, I thought the last uh, eight games of the year for the Lions, you know, Jared Goff played just about as good as anybody. So there's no reason to, to rush him on the field. And uh, I agree with Steve. I, I was when when I first saw Sean Clifford to Green Bay, I was like, what? And then I thought about it and I was like, you know, is he better than Jordan Love? Maybe uh, we'll find out, because if Jordan Love struggles or, or goes down, he may find himself on the field. And uh, this guy's played a lot of football, uh, you know, at a high level. So I, I didn't really hate that pick once I uh, stewed on a little bit. What, what did you think about it, James? Yeah, same way. You know, I, I kind of look at him as Trace McSorley light. Um, you know, they they have that similar type of game, and he was on the Christian Leitner plan at Penn State. I mean, quite frankly, I was wondering at some point if he was going to have grandkids playing with him in Happy Valley. But I mean, he constantly showed up in big big games in a lot of a lot of cases. And look who he's just got to beat out to stay on the field. There is Danny Etling. Um, I mean. Purdue, LSU, you know, wherever he ends up. I think I think his chances of sticking in Green Bay are pretty good. And quite frankly, he's one of those kids that you could just tell he's going to be good in the locker room and good in, in a film room study just because of who he's had to deal with at Penn State. He's been taught well. And St. X. Don't forget about that. Oh, I completely forgot about St. X. They, right. they, they've thrown guys in the NFL and that have, that have worked, worked out pretty good. So I, I, don't be shocked if he makes that team uh, and, and ends up, you know, potentially winning that backup job. Yeah, and and sticking up in the Minnesota area, Jaron Hall heading up to the Vikings. Uh, James, you're in you're in the Minnesota area. I mean, Kirk Cousins, guy, everybody wants to uh, wants to you know throw it out of town. And what do you think about the, that pick? You know, I I, I I think the value for him getting him where they did was smart. I'm not sure if he's the long term play. I wouldn't be a bit surprised that next year uh, the Vikes make a run at maybe a Trey Lance, um, who's a Minnesota kid, grew up in Marshall, Minnesota, had offers to play safety at a bunch of Big Ten schools, but decided to play quarterback at NDSU. I, I could see that a potential move, um, but you could definitely tell the, I mean, especially with JJ, I mean, he's made it very clear with his long-term extension that he wants to have something solidified at quarterback. I'm not so certain Jaron Hall is going to be the answer long-term. They'll do something for you to see, like you're talking about. Guaranteed. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah I, th- I think I think they'll bring somebody in for sure to compete with them. I mean, he he had he he had game, you know, especially at the beginning of the year when BYU was rolling. Yeah, um, he looked pretty good. Uh, but I, you know, I don't know whether or not he's good enough to start in the NFL. I mean, we saw them a couple of years ago draft Kellen Mond uh, out of Texas A and M, and I was like, what are they doing? And he's yeah. out of the league. He's out of the league. Uh, yeah. That's not a good sign when you draft somebody what in the second round second or third round and then they're they're out of the league in a couple of years obviously uh he wasn't good enough to play on your team and nobody else wanted him uh that's not a real good look but we'll, we'll see we'll see what Kirk Cousins does this year I mean I I don't know why people want to get rid of him when he win, won what 13 games last year I, that that's seems it, to be the offense goal. wasn't the problem I mean, defense was a significant problem, and when they drafted Jordan Addison in the first round and not addressed that cornerback position, that pretty much tells me that uh, if you're playing fantasy football, I would highly go after Justin Jefferson because they're going to have to score points to win next year. So, How about a couple of the other ones? I mean, Stetson Bennett ends up with the Rams. Uh, on, a, on the surface – Looks like a good place for him. Stafford's in place. He can sit on the bench. McVay is an offensive genius and also a kind of coach who likes to run the ball where, you know, he won't have to come out and throw 50 passes and stuff if he does get in a game. Steve, what do you think about Stetson Bennett uh, going to the Rams? Another good situation, right? Low expectation on him. Good chance around the line behind a you know, Hall of Fame quarterback in Stafford. Right? You got a guy that's put up more yards and – just about anyone else right now, right? What he did in Detroit, then he's doing it again. He stays healthy, um, gives him that opportunity to learn. That's where this gets tricky, right? If he doesn't stay healthy and continues to have that injury, but then it gets thrown in early, it's going to be rough. Yeah. It's going to be rough. I mean, that's the hard part of playing quarterback in the NFL. And like I said, it's been very few and far between where you have rookies come in and do well and weather that storm. It's really hard to do, right? Just defenses are specialized at every position, not just a handful like in college. And the schemes are really different. And the speed is faster than people can truly imagine, right? Especially at quarterback. So what? do I think his game will translate? And could he potentially do well? I do. I really do. I think he's got to have the right situation to where he can learn and kind of mature in the NFL a little bit. Well, I mean, coming from the NFL perspective, I mean, a, a, a playbook for a college quarterback is like a college class where going to the NFL – it's a doctoral class mm-hmm. where the playbook is infinitely bigger. I mean, t- I mean, tell, talk about it from that perspective. I mean, cause it's, it's way more difficult from how much you got to learn. Yeah. It's another language, but you know, concepts are going to be the same, right. And how quickly he can pick up, you know, McVay's concepts and things like that. And that's where that team talk about a doctoral. I mean, McVay knows every play. He's got a photographic memory, right? He yeah. can remember every down and distance and situation and play call. And he expects that out of his quarterbacks, right? So it's going to be a, a, a notch up for him. But I look at what Kirby Smart and that group does down in Georgia. You know, they're pretty sophisticated. And those offensive schemes and things they're doing, it'll translate well for him. It's the guys that have single read options like Richardson, right? They didn't do a lot to really help him. And if you go watch this film, you never really see him get into a second or third level read because he can run it. Yeah. And in the NFL, you have to be an elite runner to get away with that, right? So yeah. it'll be interesting. Yeah, no, I agree. And and to be honest, Stetson reminds me a little bit, uh, his game at least, a little bit of Baker Mayfield. Uh, kind of similar stature and, uh, you know, similar skill set, kind of. And uh, I could see, you know, Baker played pretty well, even mm-hmm. um, being there for a week. Uh, you know, that first game, he looked amazing. Second game, not that great. But down the line, I thought he played pretty good in that offense. And I could see uh, Stetson Bennett doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. And then Aiden O'Connell ends up with the Raiders. Uh, they got they went out and they got Garoppolo. And he's you know he's still relatively young. He's in, in his early thirties. Um, you guys are Big Ten guys, Steve and James. What do you think about Aiden O'Connell, Purdue guy? I look at the type of offense that they're trying to set up there. Right, they're going to run the ball well. They got really good tight ends. They added another with Mayer. Um, they got some good receivers. I mean, it sounds crazy, but. I'm less worried about who's the guy in the center on that team and just making sure they don't turn the ball over. And he fits into that very well, right? He didn't turn the ball over in bunches at Purdue. He can throw the ball vertical. So you got guys that can stretch the field. And the way they set it up, they'll do good play action. He needs to be able to throw the ball on the run a little bit, which he can do. So I, I think it's a good fit for them. And he's going to be able to learn behind some guys that have been around for a while. So 
I'm in a complete agreement. I, I, I'm I'm an Aiden O'Connell fan. I mean, what he did at Purdue. I mean, especially after they lost uh, Bell and uh, oh, what's his name, the receiver at Arizona now, um, the speedster. I mean, he he he. Rondell Moore. Rondell Rondell Moore. Moore. I mean, he still was a hell of a quarterback. Mm -hmm. I mean, he did more with less. I mean, look at Payne Durham. I mean, now he he turned into an NFL tight end. And a lot of that has to do with Aiden O'Connell distributing the ball really well. I mean, he really checks down incredibly well. Yeah, I think it's good value in the fourth round as well. Guy's got good size, 6'3", 213. Played a lot of football, redshirt senior. I thought last year was a little bit better than this year, honestly. Uh, when I watched his tape really closely, but, uh, you know, I didn't see anything that would lead me to believe that he, that he couldn't do it. Um, especially not being forced on the field, getting to learn under, uh, the Jimmy Garoppolo. And, and honestly, I I think he's, uh, kind of a similar quarterback to Garoppolo. So they, they don't have to change the offense, uh, to put him on the field. All right, let's go around the table. See what you guys think. Um, First and second round, surprises, best value picks. Steve, where, where, what's your, what was something that stood out for you in the first or second round that you were like, wow, where did that come from? Well, I liked what the Texans did. Right? I, I made that comment earlier about you got to have a good quarterback and you got to have a good defense. Um, you know, Do I think C.J. Stroud is a franchise quarterback? I do. Do I think Will Anderson is going to be a Hall of Famer? Yeah, I do. That guy is a freak, and he's an unbelievable football player, probably a better person right? from what I've seen him with his family and just I think you talk about starting something special they did that with two really marquee guys so it'll be interesting it's not going to pay off I think next year they're not going to go to the playoffs but you have two guys there that I think from an early round just doing some big things they're gonna they're gonna show out and do pretty well 100 percent agree I mean you, you you create two bookends at both sides of the ball that is going to be huge but I, I I I personally since Steve stole my answer I'm going to go with Seattle bringing in Dev, uh, Devon uh, Witherspoon and uh, JSN. I mean, now you've got two complete lockdown corners in Seattle. I mean, the, the last two years draft in Seattle, Pete Carroll has done a masterful job where everybody thinks you have to go from the top down. He's going from the bottom out where he is. I mean, that defense is going to be really good. If they can address their interior defense, I mean, they went to the playoffs with Geno freaking Smith, at quarterback. I mean, <laughs> If that doesn't tell you what kind of coach Pete Carroll is, I don't know what does. They had two rookies at tackle. And I I, I look at this and they just keep getting better and better and better. Yeah, I mean, um, the one pick that kind of surprised me a little bit was the McDonald uh, pick at 15. Uh, I think he's a good player. I like him. Uh, But I thought that – I mean, I just didn't – there was no need to pick him that high because nobody else I think was going to take him. Uh, you probably could have gotten him later, but you know if that's the guy you really love, uh, go for it. But he better produce because you took him at top fifteen. Uh, that that's a that's a really high pick for a guy who a lot of most people that I know of had a second round, third round grade on him. So yeah. uh, that that was kind of surprising to me. Uh, not that I don't like him, but I uh, just kind of thought that was a, a high pick. Um, the other one to me was um, you know twenty two Zay Flowers. A lot of people are high on him. He had some good numbers, uh, played well at Boston College. To me, he kind of reminds me of um, Marquise Brown, the guy they had uh, at Baltimore before. Um, Same body style, uh, same kind of skill set, but, you know, has a little bit extra in him where he can play in the slot potentially. Um, That was kind of a surprise to me. I thought they might take somebody else, but we'll we'll see. I mean, they, they have not been able to draft a wide receiver at Baltimore. I mean, Rashad Bateman. Uh, probably the best one, maybe Marquise Brown, the best two they've ever drafted, which is really sad. Uh, but we'll see if this can pan out. But it, it's going to need to because uh, they finally got Lamar locked up and they need somebody that can uh, catch the ball uh, besides Mark Andrews. Go ahead, Steve. You're going to say something? No. Okay. Uh, I mean, yeah. I agree with all that. So, yeah, back to your the McDonald pick for, with you, Nate, uh, up here in this end because the Jets feel they got screwed with that pick because they what New England did with the trade. So it's a, it's another reason they're, they're hating Belichick in this area because they think he screwed him. Yeah, I mean, I know they really needed another lineman. And the problem was the run on tackles uh, started uh, at number six with Paris Johnson Jr., another uh, St. X product, uh, by the way. Uh, he, he went number six overall, and, and, then, and then it started. You know, Darnell Wright to, 
to Chicago at 10. That was kind of surprising to me as well, considering this guy's mainly a right tackle. You take a right tackle, yeah. number 10. Uh, I don't know if they're planning on moving him, but that was kind of shocking to me. Um, but with him gone, uh, you know, with Paris Johnson gone and then Skaronsky, uh going to the Titans, uh, you know, the Steelers uh, were able to, to move up and take Broderick Jones, the last big time tackle. I just don't think they had a real high grade on any of the other linemen. And that's why they went with their uh, the, probably their second guy, uh, who was McDonald. Yeah, I just love hearing the Jet fans. Uh, like, you know, a couple of days after they get Rodgers, they have another reason to hate Belichick. So it's just a fun conversation to hear in Sports Talk Radio around here. They just wanted something else to complain about. So now <laughs> they're just like, oh, we didn't draft to this guy too. Aye. Well, is there talk around there after the Brett Favre debacle that Rodgers is going to be there one year and then somehow, some way, end up in Minnesota? Well, that's no, it's, it's not talking about that. And my biggest worry is, you know, this Jet team is heading in the right. I think they've got a good infrastructure set up for yeah. them, them to, to be successful. But now you've put the pressure on, you have to do it in the next two years. I don't think Rodgers plans on being playing in the NFL after two years. And as I ask all my Jet friends up here, if you don't get it done, is it worth it? Because now you're, then you're back to where you were before Rodgers arrived. Zach yeah. Wilson or drafting another quarterback like they had to do with Darnold, like they had to do with Wilson. I mean, right. the Jets have not had a lot of success with that. What do you I can answer there? that for you. As a Jet fan, hell yeah, it's worth it. Who are they going to draft? I mean, we got Sam Darnold, we got Mark Sanchez, we got Zach Wilson. All three of those guys blow. So uh, we obviously are not good at drafting quarterbacks. I mean, go get somebody that can do it. Uh, this guy's a four-time MVP. He's the best quarterback they've had. Uh, since Broadway Joe, and in fact, he's way better than him. So, uh, you know, even if he's only there a year, I say, thank God, uh, you finally got somebody uh, that can throw the football. So I'm all yeah, for it. Yeah, but if they don't win, then you're back to ground zero. That's all I don't care. Play. I'm excited about actually watching my team play. I could have cared less like the last 10 years. So you got to uh, swing big. You yeah. know, that, that, that's a swing big move. And Go quite frankly, them. if well, you swing and miss, at least you swung. Because yeah. I mean, do you want to be eight and eight or fourteen and two? I yeah. mean, well, I, I mean, if you go, you win a Super Bowl. I guarantee you, most fans would be fine. We they don't make the playoffs for the next five years. I but can flags fly forever. Well, I yeah, both, I can see both sides. I, mean, I want to hear what Steve has to say as someone who's been in the NFL and, and played at a high level. I mean, it does work. I mean, Stafford showed it worked. Brady showed it worked. But Steve, when you look at the NFL today, it's like they. Everything is for now. They don't build for for dynasties. They're not looking to become Patriot, the next Patriots, the next you know Dallas Cowboys, the next Niners, whatever. Is that we what we've become in the NFL? And NFL fans should expect every it's either now and then we rebuild again. Now we rebuild again. Is that what we're looking at? Uh, yes and no. Right, you got two camps right now happening in the NFL. It's kind of been this way for a while, right? You had New England was built this dynasty, and they did it through the draft. Lots of picks and trading down. Um, what have Philly and KC done the last few years? Exact same thing, right? They built it from the inside out. They have, I mean, look at their drafts this year in particular, and look at what Philly did, right? I talked earlier about you got to have a good quarterback, you got to have a good defense. All they did was just make their defense better, which was hard to do, right? I mean, they have a really good team already, and they got two really great picks in the first round. And yeah. if you look at their other picks, right, they were just bolstering other pieces of that defense, which is really smart, right? Um, then you have the other side of that coin, what we're talking about, right? I love what the Jets did. They have a good defense. They haven't had a quarterback work out for them in 20 years, maybe more, yeah, right? Yeah, right. Testaverde was the last one who got him for the championship game. Exactly, yeah. right? And so we're talking 20 plus years. And Testaverde, Hall of Famer guy, right? They've had nothing in between. They got their Hall of Famer, you gotta take your shot. So, and unfortunately, look at the coaches, right? They're under that same type of pressure. The coaches that have the luxury of being able to have success and build off of that, Andy Reid, Belichick, these younger guys that have gotten these head jobs don't have that luxury to wait, so they have to go make a splash. And right now on paper, the Jets have built it in a way that I think is going to be successful. Where this goes sideways is if that wide receiver room and Rodgers don't click. And you've seen how he's – orchestrated things at Green Bay. When him and those receivers were on the same page, they were really hard to beat. That didn't happen the last few years. They had young guys that were kind of like, whatever, you're the old guy, I'm not going to listen. And they looked bad. 
Yeah. Now you got Garrett Wilson and some really marquee guys over there. If those guys click and really get on the same page with Aaron Rodgers, watch out. Yeah. Watch out. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, that, towards the end of the season, they started playing a lot better. I know they yeah. lost to the Lions in that last game, but the last, you know, the last four or five weeks of the year, it looked like they finally got it going with Christian Watson and uh, Dobbs and those guys uh, starting to play pretty well. I, I'm in total agreement. I know we keep agreeing with each other. It's kind of lame, uh, but I do agree with Steve. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the Eagles were my, uh, they were my winners of the draft. I mean, Howie Roseman, uh, say whatever you want to about the guy. He knows what the hell he's doing. Uh, he knows who he wants and he figures out a way to get him. He sat there, uh, you know, went backwards. He had to come back up, but he went backwards and got arguably the best player in the entire draft in Jalen freaking Carter. Uh, that that's unbelievable. And then he comes back and gets Nolan Smith who, you know, blew the combine up just as much as Anthony Richardson, uh, dude weighs 245 pounds. He ran a four, three, nine. Uh, he could be the best pass rusher in this draft potentially. So you get Nolan Smith, uh, or Nolan Smith, Jalen Carter, you got Taylor Steen, another tackle that can give you a, a swing tackle that can provide depth on that offensive line. Since Lane Johnson's uh, been banged up a little bit the past few years, you can throw this guy out there. And then you got Keely Ringo uh, in the fourth round. So uh, the Eagles definitely won uh, the draft, in my opinion. And uh, I, I think how what about Roseman, Sydney Brown? Uh, Sydney Brown too. I mean, I, and I like the tackle who they got uh, from Texas in the seventh round. So every pick yeah. uh, was, was pretty good. And uh, I, I, you know, looking at all the uh, teams out there, I think I think the Eagles killed it. All right, let's let's go to the later rounds, uh, th three through seven. Um, what teams do you guys think uh, made a splash in the, the later rounds? We'll start out with James this time around. James, what do you think uh, between those those rounds? Uh, there were there's one team in particular that knocked my socks off, and that was Baltimore. Um, if you got Trenton Simpson on day three, the inside linebacker who's fast as all get out. Uh, but the pick that really really turned me on was and they're gonna have to wait a year on him but he's gonna start day one as a guard and that's Andrew Voorhees the starting guard who blew out his ACL and MCL at the combine and still threw up 38 um, uh, 38 on the bench press which I mean he had a knee brace on so really he was benching with one leg and he still threw up 38 and led all uh, offensive linemen I I in the seventh round if he doesn't blow out his ACL or MCL you're probably talking late second to maybe fourth round you get I mean how many teams trade their next year's sixth round pick to get back into the draft in the seventh round nobody it's in many cases of throwaway picks where you're trying to combine and move up now you're draft you have teams trading out picks from next year's draft to get back into the draft in the seventh round I think that was huge I think Baltimore really knocked it out of the park Steve who who did you, who did you uh who? Yeah, I mean, when you look at late round picks, um, you're talking about quantity and quality, right? And there's a really fine right. line. But the two teams that did a lot, look at Green Bay and Indianapolis. A, they had a lot of picks. I mean, just looking at pure volume, I mean, they got a lot of guys coming in there. And it'll be interesting to see who out of that group really comes in and makes an impact. You're going to have two, three guys that you draft late that are going to be big impact players later in the season. Those are the two that I would watch just because pure numbers, right? They drafted a lot of guys. Um, so it'll be interesting to see, but nothing, I mean, you know, third, fourth, fifth rounds, they kind of, nothing really stood out, right? It, it felt like everything went as it should, right? People slotted in, there's a lot of quarterbacks selected, so that'll be interesting to see how that gets played out, but nothing really stuck out um, in my mind, but no. Yeah. I've got, uh, I've got some guys that, that I think were, were, were value picks that, that kind of went later for whatever reason. Um, you know, we talked about uh, before the draft, we talked about potentially getting a starting running back in the later rounds. I don't know if this guy will start right away, but but Chase Brown, uh, the running back out of Illinois, really impressed me last year. He carried that team on his back, uh, you know, was hard to stop, to be honest yeah. with you, all year long against some pretty good defenses in the Big Ten. Uh, that guy goes to the Bengals. They, they lost Samaji Pirine and then Joe Mixon. Uh, may or may not be on the field all year. And even if he is, he needs a complimentary back. I love the Chase Brown pick. And then the Jets uh, getting, uh, God, I, I, I love saying this name, Israel Panikande from uh, uh, Pittsburgh. I love that running back too. Uh, yeah. He was the best running back in the ACC, in my opinion. Uh, and then Deuce Vaughn going to the Cowboys. 
Uh, they got him late. That guy tore up the, the Big 12 for several years. I think he'll be a good change of pace. And then um, uh, Zach Charbonnet going to – the Seahawks got two good backs late. They got Kenny McIntosh out of Georgia – uh, late in t- pick 237, and they got Zach Charbonnet pick 52. I think they got two guys uh, that can play uh, with uh, Kenneth Walker the third, who they got last year. So I, I love those running backs. And then, um, you know, a, a couple wide receivers that went really late that me and James, uh, you know, valued pretty high. That's A.T. Perry uh, from Wake Forest. I, I think he's actually better than a lot of guys on the Saints right now. And uh, I take him over Tra- Traquan Smith any day. I think – uh, you know, A.T. Perry may find his way on the field. And then a dude who who dropped uh, considerably uh, is Kayshawn Boutte, uh, the badass talent out of LSU that for whatever reason last year, well, the main reason is they had a running back playing quarterback. Uh, but, you know, he had some issues uh, with Brian Kelly and, and didn't have the best year. But uh, going to the Patriots, it was kind of an interesting pick. And he definitely has the talent uh, to make that team. Well, what about Charlie Jones going to Cincinnati in the fourth, too, as well? Yeah, he's going to have trouble getting on the field right away just because Agreed. of uh, Tyler Boyd, T. Higgins, and Jamar Chase, who I think is the best wide out in the game. So, uh, But he'll, he'll, he'll definitely make the team, I think, and he'll, he'll provide uh, some depth. And then also I think he'll return kicks for them as they haven't really had a dynamic uh, punt or kick returner. Yeah, Brian Kelly with uh, quarterback problems. That's news. Well, <laughs> sun rises and east sets in the west, and Brian Kelly and quarterback issues. Grant, yeah. their spring game was pretty freaking good in LSU, yeah. which is unusual for them. So yeah, they might have some competition at quarterback this year. Uh, as you know, some of the younger guys started to come on later, and then they brought some guys in as freshmen. So we'll see what happens there. But last and last but not least, I like Noah Suell, the uh, the uh, Panay Sewell's brother who uh, went to the Bears at uh, pick number 148 overall. That guy, uh, you know, didn't go until round five, uh, but I could see him coming in and starting uh, for this Bears team because he, he upgrades their talent uh, considerably. All right, I'm gonna, uh, we're going to go we're looking at overall teams, and I, I just so you know where I'm getting this from, it's not from me. It's a guy named Vinny Iyer who broke down all the teams. And the team, this might get stir the pot and get everything going like you want, Nate. He rated your Jets as the worst draft. <laughs> I, you know what? I don't know. It's hard, kind of hard to argue. I mean, uh, I, especially after last year, you know, I thought yeah. Joe Douglas killed it uh, last year and just had the best draft that the Jets ever ever had. And this year, you know, I, I liked the the running back, but you know that uh, they already have Brees Hall, and uh, it's not like that was a huge need uh, with their with their uh, running back room. So I got to be honest with them. Um, I agree. I, I this this draft uh, kind of looks like poop. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think you got it too. I, I, we got it right. Perspective, and again, with how the Aaron Rodgers pursuit has dominated, everybody expected them to just grab everything, and you know, it, it, it can't be done. There's other teams picking. So and that's it. Uh, let's start out in the in this. I'm going by what this guy said, but he gave the Pittsburgh Steelers the A plus best rating. What do you guys think about the Pittsburgh Steelers draft? You Steve? know, I, or oh, Jim, James? No, go go hmm. ahead, go ahead, Steve. No, I mean, it's not bad, right? I love their pick with Joey Porter Jr. I think he's a great football player, and he's going to yeah. fit perfectly into that scheme. But then again. Their other pick with the tight end at Darnell Washington, I think he's going to be sneaky good for that offense, right? So there's really some solid picks there, but overall, it's, I mean, top to bottom, I think they addressed some concerns and things that they needed. So it'll be it'll be interesting how those ones play out. A hundred percent in agreement. I mean, the only thing I would add is Keanu Benton and Nick Herbig, the Wisconsin guys. Benton especially, I think he really fits that Pittsburgh defense quite a bit, and Herbig is literally you know, um, a JV version of Watt. So I, I think they they really strengthen the need, especially on that front seven. Well, my biggest pick for them was their offensive tackle. Uh, their offensive line has not been the same the last three or four years. Um, you know, even at the end of Ben Roethlisberger's uh, time there, they just couldn't protect him. Uh, they couldn't run the football like they used to. I mean, we all remember uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers for 40 years just running people over uh, left and right, and they haven't been able to do that 
uh, because their offensive line has sucked so bad. So I think they made the right move going out and, and adding Broderick Jones at pick 14. Uh, kid has room to get better uh, first and foremost, but he's got the frame. He's got the athleticism. Uh, he's already good. And I think he could have the chance to be great. All right. Well, we, the second team this guy gives is a high grade to is Philadelphia. You all agree on that. We've been through that. Yeah. Uh, unless there's something else you want to add about what Philadelphia that we haven't covered already. Cause <laughs> if his number three guy is, is the Indianapolis Colts gives them an A plus rating. Um, what do you think about that rating? Too high for what the Colts have done? Steve? Like I said, their first pick gives me pause, but then when you look at their later rounds, just from a volume standpoint, they address a lot of things that they need to do, right? So I think in the later rounds, they did a great job and got a lot of value for the picks they had. They just put a lot of eggs in that basket at quarterback, which given this draft class, I don't know if I would have done that, but that's, uh, that's my two cents. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I agree. I, it, it's all, you know, you talk about evaluating a team's draft. It's hard to do the day afterwards. Uh, we're we're going to have to see what happens the next four or five years to really uh, evaluate the draft class. That being said, it all depends on Anthony Richardson. Uh, if he's good, we'll all be like, this is the greatest draft ever. If he sucks, uh, it'll be the worst. And and that's, <laughs> that's, the, uh, that's the problem with picking a quarterback at number four. Uh, you know, that's all anybody's going to remember. Yeah, agreed. I mean, I will say Julius Brents at uh, in second round and Blake Freeland in the fourth were really quality picks. I think a lot of people are going to get to hear Julius Brents name a little bit more. He really showed out, especially um, in the uh, I thought in the Big 12 championship game. He really played extremely well. Uh, the next one I want to talk about because it's close to my heart is the New York Giants. Um they got the coin. They got a good cornerback. They they got a, a center, and then they, they went out and got the wide receiver. What do you guys think of their overall draft, Steve? What do you think about the Giants, and can they keep moving forward like they did last year? I think so. Right, they got the right quarterback there, and they gave him another tool with Hyatt. You know, I think he's an elite receiver, and he's going to do some big things there. Um, you know, their other picks. I like their cornerback pick. He's a big guy. He's physical. Um, yeah, it'll be interesting, right? That team's going to run and go by Jones and Shaquan Barkley, right? They stay healthy. They have these other tools that will be successful. Um, are they going to beat Buffalo and others? Don't know. I don't know if they did enough to overcome that. What about you, what about you James? I mean, it, the Giants, the big the big, uh, you know, elephant in the room is always going to be what the Eagles did, and we all know the Eagles got stronger. Have the Giants done enough yet to start closing that gap? I know they haven't closed the gap, but – I, I think it's all going to come down to the offensive line because you look at what Philly, uh, Philly addressed across their front seven. I'm a huge fan of Michael uh, John Michael Schmitz. I mean, I've seen that kid since this moment he stepped on campus, and all he does is outperform expectations. I mean, he found a way to break into that starting lineup very early um, during his career at Minnesota and turned out to be the best offensive lineman of the group when you had guys – high four stars, low five stars in Falale and Dunlap. And you just sit there and watch Schmitz, incredibly cerebral, but he is just a brawler. I mean, you could see the Chicago influence in watching him play. And, I mean, this kid was very under-recruited. He was originally supposed to go to Western Michigan, and then when Fleck took the job at Minnesota, he flipped the day he came and came over to Minnesota and – got on the field very quickly and really that's going to be the biggest loss Minnesota's going to have this year is losing him. He is a generational talent at the center position. This center draft was really good. Nate. Yeah, no, I like uh, banks a lot. I think they needed a corner big time and uh, they, they fulfilled that they're, they're, they're still probably going to need another wide out to be honest with you, considering how horrible that, that wide receiver uh, group performed as a whole. I mean, Kenny Galladay was just an absolute bust uh, for whatever reason. I always kind of liked him in uh, Detroit and he put up big numbers there, but uh, could not uh, catch a cold in New York and um, they, they need some help. So getting Jalen Hyatt in the third round, I think was pretty good considering uh, he was the Bolitnikoff winner and, and had a tremendous season. Um, and then they, they added Eric Gray, who's another kid uh, from here in Tennessee. Uh, he played for UT first and then transferred to Oklahoma uh, guy was productive this whole time, so I think he can provide some depth in that running back room as well. I want to talk to you guys about uh, Detroit now. 
Uh, they went out and got Gibbs. They got Campbell. And there was a lot of grumbling from the supposed talking heads and experts on, you know, those were reach picks. Detroit was a nice surprise story last year, heading in the right direction. Uh, Steve, what do you think about what Detroit did in the draft? I mean, they picked up a playmaker in Gibbs, right? He's pretty dynamic. Um, I thought it was strange once they, you know, when they did that originally, and then obviously they made some moves in that running back room. No, nope. <laughs> it's an interesting, he addressed picks for positions that he knew he needed to make an impact with. And out of all the coaches in the NFL, um, I really like his style. And if there's a guy that's in tune to his team, I think he made the right picks that are going to fit into his scheme and what they want to do and how they want to play physical and things like that. So you, you want to select for fit just as much as talent. And I think if you look at Detroit, their fit is really good across all their picks, in my opinion. Yeah. Oh, but he got it. He got got Dan Campbell. uh, He got Dan Campbell guys, don't you think, James? Oh, Jack Campbell. I'm. I think it's probably. I mean, you know how much I don't like Iowa. Probably as much as you know, (laughs) Steve doesn't like Michigan. But I mean, Jack Campbell is freaking amazing. I mean, honestly, I think you have to go back. Larry Station is probably, you know, the 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 how, how good a linebacker he was. And it's not like Iowa hasn't had good linebackers over the last 40 years. They have. It's mm-hmm. just Campbell's a generational talent, better than Chad Greenway. And, I mean, 6'4", six, 6'5", six, can just come down like a hammer in, in in run support, but then is incredibly nimble to go back. I mean, that interception he had against Ohio State was impressive for a guy his size. And they have to find a way to really help that interior defense if Detroit – and I, I got to say Detroit, I think, is going to win the Central or the North this year. I'm still thinking the old Central way. Um Dan Campbell's building something special there. He's got a culture. He's really building. He's got a really college philosophy. And you look at him on paper last year, and you're like, after they trade Hawkinson, you thought they were just playing for the draft. And they nearly made the playoffs. Yeah, no, they came on strong. As I mentioned, they won the last seven of eight games uh, that they played in and then knocked, uh, knocked the Packers uh, out of the playoffs with that last game. So uh, that was pretty impressive. And then I think they went out and got guys that fit their system, like Steve said, uh, Jack Campbell come in. Think about that. Jack Campbell right next to Malcolm Rodriguez, uh, the kid from o- uh, Oklahoma State uh, yeah. that was an unreal linebacker in college. I mean, you have two of be- uh, college football's uh, best linebackers in the last few years side by side. Uh, you've got a Laporte guy from Iowa who also uh, can can catch and block. And then Brian Branch. Uh, the kind of do-it-all uh, corner from Alabama. He can play safety. He can play corner, uh, play nickel. He can do pretty much everything. Uh, so I, I think they uh, did a really good job just increasing the talent. And they've done a good job in free agency, too. So uh, they, they've they made it so they have one of the better rosters uh, in that division, and uh, they can compete with Minnesota, I think. Well, I mean, you look at their offensive line. I think this is what, if I'm Jameer Gibbs right now, I'm feeling a little bit better about life because – You've got Taylor De- Taylor Decker, Jonah Jackson, Frank Ragnell, Gra- Graham Glasgow, and Penny Sewell as your offensive line. Yeah, lots of Holy- Buckeyes in there, and uh, one of the best O lines in the in the league, in my opinion. Oh my god! I mean, I remember Frank Ragnell when he played at Chan Has in high school. I thought for sure he was either going to go to Minnesota or Wisconsin. Ends up at Arkansas, and heck, now he's a freaking uh, Pro Bowler. And let's talk about one more controversial franchise right now in the NFL. And right now they're they're sitting after this draft where it looks like all their rivals did some good work in the draft. You got the Cleveland Browns. Um, on this guy's sheet, he their their picks are rated below Cincinnati, Baltimore, and Pittsburgh, who are already ahead of those guys. What do you think, Steve, about what the Cleveland did in this draft? I mean, I'm happy they got a bunch of Ohio State guys, right? Um, (laughs) they're picking up some pieces that were badly needed you know you look at what they did they mortgaged themselves for quarterback yet again um and the browns have historically done that and hasn't really worked out for them so i hope you know where where it'll be interesting i know they signed a couple other buckeyes as well in undrafted free agents i i think that's where they're trying to make their their hay this year it's just they didn't have a ton of great picks right um just from volume wise and then who they got, they're just trying to fill in holes. I mean, their offensive line and back end weren't great. So it'll be interesting. Their quarterback pick, 
um, with the kid out of UCLA. Yeah. Interesting, right? Um, you know, we'll see how he plays out. I, I, I look at his game and I don't see the arm and some of the things that, you know, are going to translate into the NFL. And he doesn't have a veteran to learn that from. So, I, I, again, just not a great overall draft for them outside of them getting some butt guys in my opinion. I mean, it's kind of hard to call a successful draft when them and San Francisco don't draft till, well, right. the end of the second day. I mean, right. I think they got a lot of good athletes in this draft. I mean, some guys like Whipler, I was shocked that lasted to the sixth round. Um, but, I, yeah. Yeah, no, it's hard to it's hard to knock it out of the park when you don't have a pick till number 11 in the third round, like James said. But they, uh, I do like, I think, Dewan Jones in the fourth round. That's a, that's a huge pick. Yeah. He was probably the best player. Him and John Michael Schmitz were the two best players at the Senior Bowl, in my opinion. Uh, he really proved that he, you know, isn't just a big guy. Uh, he's a bat. He's a former basketball player uh, from Indianapolis, and he can uh, he can move way better than people think at six eight three seventy five. So I think uh, dewan has got a chance to to play uh, for the Browns. But but other than that, uh, you know, this this draft kind of worries me uh, as far as the Browns' success. But that's okay because I hate the Browns, so I hope they do suck. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the wide receiver they did take at, at their number one pick, Cedric Tillman, you know, he, uh, he missed almost the entire season last year with injuries and uh, tore his knee. So I don't know how much he's going to be able to help uh, right away. And another team that's kind of mired in, in kind of controversy, I mean, after last year, Denver Broncos, you're getting Sean Payton into town. They, they're, they're strapped with no draft capital. Uh, what did they do in the draft? It impressed you or did you think it was just a wash? Steve? It was a wash, right? They had what, five yeah. picks? Yeah. Um, they got the best value they could at that pick with Mims. And I think it's another tool that Sean Payton will use very well, right? He's had multiple players that are like him. Um, but beyond that, I, again, they didn't have enough volume to, to really make an impact. No. It's funny watching uh, Seattle, who had a way better season. They, they not only – you know, they traded away Russell Wilson, went with Geno Smith. Everybody thought the Seahawks would be the worst team in the league. They had a tremendous year. And then they, you know, obviously get to reap uh, the fruits of their labor by getting uh, all those draft picks in it. So, um, you know, they, they definitely have come out ahead on this deal, uh, not only with, with the quarterback deal, but, but with the players that they've gotten uh, from the trade and then also, you know, from this draft. I mean, uh, this is – you suck as bad as the Broncos did last year, and you only add what five guys. Uh, that's not a good. That's not a good sign. Even though I like Drew Sanders, I, I will say that Jail Skinner kid has some huge upsides. I mean, how often do you see a six four, two hundred ten pound safety? I mean, that's just that's huge. And you see him how he came downhill. He reminded me a lot of watching Taylor Mays when he was at USC. Not Taylor Mays in the NFL, but Taylor Mays. Yeah, in the Taylor Mays in the NFL wasn't good. <laughs> that was awful. <laughs> it's a failed experiment, but uh, yeah, I mean, I just, I'm just saying, they need help in in a big way uh, in Denver right now, and not, you know, I haven't really loved their off season, and then, um, you know, to only get five guys in the draft. Uh, hopefully, they pick up some good undrafted free agents because they're going to need some of them to play. Well, let's give, uh, let's go around. I know we were short on time. A quick overview. Uh, Bears, Bears draft. Thumbs up, thumbs down for me, guys. Uh, Steve, start it off. Yeah, I mean, I'm indifferent. I would say thumbs up. They pick players that they need, right? They got to try to protect Justin Fields. Hopefully, those guys will do that. We'll see. Truth be told, don't know yet. Yeah, I'm not. I didn't like. I mean, I've watched Darnell Wright here for years, and um, he's a good player. Uh, he certainly, you know, lived up to the billing in, in, in Knoxville here, but I just. I, I don't know if he was the right guy, but we'll see. Um, but overall, it wasn't, you know, I, I like Noah Sewell, the guy in the fifth round, but, um, you know, they're, they're, this is kind of a wait and see one. I just, I don't have anybody on this list here that really jumps out at me as uh, a big time difference maker. I mean, you look at the, the Bears draft and you look at the Texans draft, probably the two worst teams in the league last year. Which team got better, in your opinion, the Texans yeah. or the Bears? In my opinion, it's the goddamn Texans. Uh, they added two generational talents, and yeah. the uh, Bears got Darnell Wright. I mean, who who won that deal? Well, not only that, you traded back and then traded again when you had a chance of getting guy the who number was one. Yeah, number they, one they were number two, right? Or they were number one, right? 
Well, now, yeah, they were number one. I mean, the problem I have with this is Darnell Wright, don't get me wrong. You're right. He's a good right tackle. But Peter Skronsky, who's from Chicago, is a Bears fan. And if you haven't watched Peter Skronsky play, man, this guy's a mauler. I mean, he reminds me a lot of uh, Lewin at Tennessee. Just it, it, it would have been a perfect pick for Chicago, and then they picked Darnell Wright. I mean, I feel bad saying that because the guy got picked 10, and he's, he should be a first-round draft pick, but – well, they had got Broderick Jones and uh, Skaronsky were both available, and I, yeah. I like both. I like both those guys better uh, in my opinion. Maybe that's just me. Maybe I'm freaking wrong. I, I could uh, be wrong. There's no, there's no telling. But I liked both of them better uh, than Darno Wright because because both Great. of them can play left tackle, and that's yeah. really where you you know where you want to get the uh, you know the best player. I mean, because you do have a big investment at quarterback. I mean, you don't want you know him to get Joe Theismann, you know. Call me crazy, but, you know, you want to protect your investments. I agree. What about a team like the Saints? Uh, anything you see there that you like, Steve, or are the Saints uh, still treading water? Treading water. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, they're, they're glaring issues, right, for the Saints. they got to solidify a quarterback position. Uh, I think they've tried to do that in the offseason, but, they, I mean, yeah, it's a solid, solid pitch. They did what they could, but nothing that stands off and says, hey, that's really unbelievable, right? Like, they're just treading water. Yeah, they definitely Cowboys, didn't, make Cowboys, a, they didn't make the splash. But I, I like, uh, you know, I like the Saints roster. I just don't like the Saints coach. I mean, they were in a lot of those games last year, yeah. one score, uh, you know, and a final play type games, and they lost almost all of them um, because they don't have Sean Payton anymore. And, uh uh, the guy's a good defensive coordinator, but uh, I'm not. I'm not so sure he's a great uh, head coach. Someone's got to win the South. Who's, <laughs> who's it going to be? I mean, honestly, I, this is just kind of like scratch your head moment because I, you look through that entire thing. Someone's got to win it. I mean, it won't be Carolina. I mean, you think almost Atlanta... went with Sam Darnold last year? I, I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's, it's interesting. Well, we'll, we'll see. But, uh, you know, they all uh, we, we come out of this draft and it was kind of like, well, who got better? Who's the best quarterback in the in the division now? And, I, I you know, I'm still not sure. I mean, uh, Derek Carr, a lot of people like him. Some people don't like him, but I definitely think he's the most, uh, you know, definitely the most seasoned uh, player that that's been out there. He's got a, he's got a leg up on Baker and Desmond Ritter and, and obviously the rookie. So. I would let's just go three more quick ones. Uh, Tampa Bay, uh, Todd Bowles is kind of on the hot seat now. You got to say that post Brady, did Tampa Bay do anything that impressed you guys? Anything, Steve? Anybody? Nothing. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I mean, yeah, they've done nothing to make their offense better. Which their defense was not the issue, right? They arguably had one of the worst offensive lines ever. So they drafted some some linemen, but. They did nothing to help their offense, right? Their defense was by far the backbone, and their glaring problem is on offense. So I just – they did nothing to help them out there. Yeah, I agree. Uh, they – they um, I, I thought this draft was kind of crucial to their success, and to be honest, there's nothing on here that I'm impressed with um, and nobody that I think kind of, kind of points the needle uh, uh, the way they want it to go. So I, I wasn't real impressed with their draft, and – uh, the off season for them has been kind of lackluster as well. In fact, a lot of guys are wanting out. Uh, Devin White's demanding a trade, and uh, you know Shaq Barrett's coming back from injury, hopefully. But uh, they, th this team's in flux for sure. And how about the Buffalo Bills? I mean, uh, I heard mixed reviews on Dalton Kincaid at tight end. Uh, was that a need they had to pay him to fill? How? What are you guys overall feeling on that? I'll start with James on this one. What do you think about the Bills and their draft? You know, I, I, I like Dalton Kincaid, but I, I don't know if it was something you go that high in the first round on. Because it wasn't I, Knox I, enough for them? I, I thought so. I mean, I, I don't see Kincaid as being that kind of generational guy. I will say I like Osiris Torrance a lot. I mean, I think he is <laughs> – I mean, he's just a brawler. He and the Brecker kid out of Old Miss I thought were really two quality picks that they had, but – I, I don't see anything that's gonna. I mean, let's be honest. It's the, the, this is their time. They gotta get over the Kansas City hump, and the AFC has gotten 
really, really good overall. I mean, it's 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 the division where it's just so loaded. I mean, there's so many quarterbacks throughout that entire division. I like it, and I like it in the fact that if you look at the teams that have been contending for Super Bowls, they've had this elite tight end that creates mismatch problems, right? Kansas City's done a – I mean, they got the blueprint for it. Yeah, I think Charles Kincaid can do that, right? But do you think so, he could be Travis Kelsey? No one can right now, right? Yeah. So, I mean, no, him. But if you look at – if you're going to draft a guy and take a shot for a tight end, out of all the ones, I like Kincaid the most. He's a oh, yeah. Guy. He's coming from a upside. great coach. I think he's getting put into a situation where he doesn't have to be the guy, but he can go run free and make some big plays, right? I mean, they just added another piece of the puzzle that can really stretch the defense. And now you got to pick and choose. How do you cover Diggs and their other deep threat? And then now you got a tight end running through the middle. It's, I think it's a really good pick for them. Yeah, and, and look at the teams that have had two good tight ends, you know, the Patriots in the past uh, when they've had two good ones. I mean, they've really been able to play off that and and play some 12 personnel that's caused other teams' problems. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kincaid is a guy, too, that I agree with Steve. It, he can get better. Uh, this is a guy who no one really talks about this, but he was a walk-on at San Diego. Uh, yeah. That's where he started his career. It was a Division II school that didn't even offer him a scholarship. And not only did he make it uh, to where he could play there, he got it to where he earned a scholarship to go to uh, Utah and then, hell, led them to the Rose Bowl uh, and, and several big-time bowl games and, and, you know, was one of the better teams in all of college football. So I, I think this guy could be uh, potentially the difference maker that could get the Bills over the hump uh, if he keeps getting better. And then, of course, everybody's favorite team to hate, including me, uh, the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, they added to their defense. Uh, I, what do you guys think of Maisie Smith? What's, what's your overall feel on him? I, I'll start with Jay and Steve on this one. I hate him. <laughs> <laughs> He's yeah, gonna I, have I didn't see that one coming, Nate. <laughs> I mean, he's a big boy. He's going to require double teams. He's going to make their defense better, um, especially when you got a Michael Parsons on the outside, setting the edge. Uh, they definitely got better with that pick. Again, the Cowboys' problem isn't on defense. <laughs> right? It's on offense. Yeah. So, yeah. They, they, they've done nothing in the offseason. They've done nothing in you know to help that. So it's a, it was a ho hum good draft, right? They added solid players across the board. I think Matthew Smith's going to do a good job for them. But other than that, like, I didn't see anything that stood out. No, and I'm I'm with Steve. I think uh, you know they, as much as I hate him because he played at Michigan, he is a pretty good player. But they they already they're they're just fine on defense. So I thought this is exactly where somebody needed to pick a tight end. Uh, you know, Michael Mayer was stay, uh, staring you in the face. Uh, there, there's a couple guys. I mean, Dalton Schultz is gone. I don't really. I guess they like the two tight ends they have, and then they also drafted uh, what Schoonmeyer, uh, another Michigan player, which makes me want to puke. Uh, but uh, I don't like him as much as I like uh, Michael Mayer. I mean, Michael I Mayer was was the best tight end in all of college football with you know him and Kincaid, uh, Schoonmaker's uh, blocking guy. So yeah. I, I just I didn't like this draft at all. Um, you know, Deuce Vaughn's probably my favorite pick, and and he went in the sixth round and is a third down back. So that's not a good sign uh, when you're trying to win your division and knock off the uh, Philadelphia Eagles. Well, I, I kept looking at us. You got a not only mayor, but you had a guy like Kraft, the kid out of South Dakota State. I mean, there were other guys there that were available. That I mean, it didn't make much sense to me. Well, they could have got Michael Mayer. They could have got Nolan Smith. Um, you know, two guys that that could make a huge uh, impact at, at, at premier positions. And they took a D tackle where they already have a pretty good room. Yeah, it was probably the rumor is that uh, you know. Jerry Jones is getting ready to, to go after Harbaugh next year, bringing his boys down here from Michigan. Uh, overall, Steve, the team that did the most you think to help themselves and the team that did the least, which you think? Yeah, I mean, I don't think the Browns did anything to help themselves, right? They, I mean, uh, they didn't have an opportunity to do too much, but that was that. As far as pitch, I'm going to go with Tennessee again, or the, the Titans again. Um, I got two guys that I think are going to make impacts right away. Um, and I just, you, you get two picks to do that. I think they pick two of the best guys available and they're going to do really well. I mean, it'll, it'll be fun to watch to see what kind of impact they have. James, you're over your best and worst. Uh, I agree with Steve on the worst. Best, I keep going back to Philly and Seattle. 
I, I just I think they just they're building they're both building something there that could become pretty special. I think Seattle, if they can find that quarterback, I mean, if Gino can do it, it, it would be freaking shock among those shocks. But it, it, it what they're building in Seattle is really special, especially on the defensive side of the ball. It looks so reminiscent of the first time he ran through there. And that defense could be really pretty good. Yeah, I liked uh, the Eagles. Obviously, I, I did like the Lions. Um, to be honest, the the Broncos and uh, um, you know the Cowboys are two teams that I think kind of had a had a lackluster day, and then the Bears. Uh, I just keep going back to uh, you know just comparing them to the Texans. I mean, I, I didn't really have a problem with them trading down because they needed more guys, but then the guys they picked uh, didn't really wow me. So in, instead of uh, going and getting somebody that can help you right now start to get better, uh, you go backwards, and then you you don't really. Um, you know, clean it up. So I just think the the, the Bears. Uh, I'm not sure how much better they got with this draft, and and they were one of the worst teams in the league. So they they needed the help. So I, they they kind of disappointed me. So overall, our, our you know you guys your your view of this draft. I know we have to wait two or three years to see how it shakes out for sure. But of the buzz that we're getting, I mean, up around here, the ones I the, when I listen to ESPN, when I listen to the the sports talk radio around here. Not much buzz on this draft, and, I, and maybe is this was this a, a a a lower level draft? Do you think, Steve, or is it just an average draft? Or what do you think when we look back on this draft, we might uh, talk about? I I think it's going to be a lot better than people think, right? I think we back to my comments earlier, right? We got twenty four hour scrutiny and reporting on this, but I, I think some of the players that you seen come out that went to Philly. Um, you know, this Will Anderson, like I said, I think he's a Hall of Famer. I really do. And you're going to see some guys make some plays and make really big impacts. So I still think it was a good draft. I think it's much like every year, right? You're going to have the top five or six teams that really hit the mark. And then you're going to be the other ones. You're going to say, hey, what happened to that guy? You brought up the mound, the quarterback they drafted for Minnesota in the second round. Like, I didn't even know he was out of the league, which yeah. is crazy. And you're going to have that every year, yeah. unfortunately, right? So I think it was a good draft. I don't think there was anything – um, good, bad, or different about it, right? It's a pretty standard NFL draft, in my opinion. Yeah, I thought it was a decent draft. Like I mentioned earlier, there was some players that got drafted later that showed uh, that the draft did have some depth to it. And uh, you know, you never know about the first round. I mean, it's kind of a crapshoot. You're about, you know, you're fifty, you're, you're batting fifty percent, and uh, that's that's tough. Uh, that's why the a lot of these guys get fired, right? Uh, they're they're you know, half right, half wrong most of the time. And uh, you, you miss on the first round guys and, and everybody remembers it. I mean, as long as you don't draft Demetrius Underwood, I think you're in a pretty good space. So, <laughs> I mean, great. I'm kind of aging myself right there, but uh, you know, it, 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 there were certain position groups that I don't think was as deep as you see in the past, like wide receiver where, I mean, what, there were only four drafted in the first round this year. And, I think what Vegas is predicting 3.5, where in past years you had seven, eight. Um, it's going to be. Because we only had one from Ohio State come out this year. That's true. That's, yeah, that's yeah, part of the problem. <laughs> and, he's still, and he still was the first guy taken. And my that's my favorite thing is last year we had two guys go 11 and 12, and they're like, oh, the best guy uh, is still on the, on the Buckeyes team. Then he goes – uh, the first wide receiver this year, and they're like, well, the best guy's still on the team and Marvin Harrison Jr. So, uh, and, and to be honest, some of these freshman kids that are coming in uh, are, are going to shock you as well. So that that's a, a group where if you need a wide receiver and you're in the NFL, just draft the the, the best Buckeye available. Well, uh, it's, it's funny. I looked at mocks for next year, and they have Harrison at two, and they have a Buka at eight. I'm like, you have multiple Ohio State guys come out. I mean, heck, if JSN just even sets foot on the field last year, he's a top ten pick. Yeah, yeah, he didn't yeah. play at all. That was that was disappointing because he had such a great uh, junior season. Uh, it, it shows you how good that year was last year because he he played like four snaps this year and he still was the first wideout taken. That's that's saying something. You guys still got a little bit of time left, or what do we got going on? Here? Yeah, I think we I think we're about ready to roll here. All right. I got a couple. I got a couple more minutes. If you got another right. question, I got. A, I got one thing here. Okay, I'm gonna throw. I got a list of players that weren't drafted. I'm gonna. If you stop me when you get to someone you that you think should have been drafted, Eli Ricks of Alabama, cornerback. 
Yeah. I, I, yeah. Uh, I mean, that guy was one. That guy was probably the top guy in the portal uh, last year uh, when he left uh, LSU. And uh, I know he didn't have the greatest season, but to see him drop out of the draft was was pretty surprising. How about Ronnie Hickman of Ohio State? He could have got drafted. I think some of the things he put on film late in big play in big big games probably solidified why he didn't. I do think he's a good pickup for the Browns. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's tough when you get into that DB. You know, and you just name two guys that are good football players that are going to make an impact. But do you get a draft pick because he's talent or do you get a better fit for your team? And that's where these fifth, sixth, seventh round picks become really important. You want to find the best fit with the right talent. And I think that's where these free agents go. And that's why he's a good pick for Cleveland. Yeah, he's a guy that can definitely come up and and, uh, help with run fits. And, uh, you know, has some coverage ability as well. I mean, as Steve mentioned, the Michigan game and uh, some of the defensive lapses in the Georgia game as well probably hurt his stock. Uh, but this is a guy who made a lot of plays all year long. He had some interceptions. Uh, he had some big time plays that won us games. So uh, I can see him making the team in Cleveland and and uh, getting on the field. All right. Hey, thanks for letting me sit in with you guys. Fun morning here. Yeah, thanks, Steve. We appreciate you joining us, man. Uh, we we enjoyed it, and we thank you for your uh, uh, insights today, brother. Appreciate it, man. Enjoy it as always. All right, Great. we'll talk to you again real soon. Okay, bud. Thanks, guys. All right, thanks, James. See you, buddy. Hey, you bet. Have a great day. You too, man. Have a great. Day.